you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're still in chapter 4. Lord willing, we'll be exiting chapter 4 next week. But this week, we still have two final parables in chapter 4 from Jesus. These parables are often referred to as Jesus' kingdom parables. And that's because Jesus is teaching in these parables about the, God, the, the kingdom of God and specifically the growth of God's kingdom. So keep that theme in mind because it unites both of these parables as Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a growing seed and to a mustard seed. Hear now from God's word. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. We find in these two parables, I think, much encouragement in a culture that is continually growing corrupt and in a land where darkness seems to be creeping in and even prevailing, Jesus teaches us otherwise. Jesus reveals that the kingdom of God is a kingdom full of perfect light and a pure hope, and its growing shall one day be made manifest for all to see. While the growth of this kingdom remains mysterious to us, we can take heart that its increase is inevitable and invincible. Mark summarizes this section of his gospel account by essentially communicating in these final two verses that one's proximity to Jesus determines whether we understand this truth about the growth of God's kingdom or not. It is only when we draw near to Jesus, when we are in close proximity, close communion and connection with him, that we may understand the secret of God's kingdom. To his disciples, Jesus explained everything privately. What a blessed conference that would have been for them. And we shouldn't be discouraged because I think we have that same ability to have that same private conference with the Spirit of God, even illuminating His Word right now, shining through His Word, allowing us to understand it and to reap the blessings that He would have us to get from it. So praise God. We're going to be looking at these two parables in two parts, one by one. The first parable is going to teach us how the kingdom of God grows, and the second parable of this mustard seed reveals the proportion to which God's kingdom grows. So let's take a look at Jesus' first parable in verses 26 to 29. The emphasis of this parable, I don't think the slides are working, but the emphasis of this parable is on how the kingdom of God grows, or the means of this kingdom's growth. It's worth mentioning that this is the only place in all four Gospels where this parable of Jesus occurs. So this is unique, and it's a particular parable that Jesus spoke on this beach at the Sea of Galilee that day. And Mark, I think, is including it so that we would read it carefully and glean much from it. So we're going to spend most of our time on this parable because it's unique, but we'll also jump into the later parables later. Jesus returns in this parable to using similar terminology and elements from the one he's already given in the first 20 verses of this chapter. Once again, we see this parable centers on a sower, some scattered seed, and soil. However, as we read through this parable, in contrast to the parable of the soils that we looked at a few weeks ago, 
we can easily spot some differences. In Jesus' first parable, in verses 1 to 20, the primary focus was on the nature and the receptivity of the soil to the scattered seed. The four different soils represented the different responses and how a person received the word of God as Jesus taught. But now, in verses 26 through 29, the primary focus shifts away from the soil onto the seed. Even the sower in this parable is not intended to be front and center. He shows up at the very beginning to sow the seed, and he shows up at the end in order to reap the ripe harvest. But what is this man doing in the middle that causes this seed to grow? Verse 27, he sleeps and he rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He knows not how. Ultimately, Jesus made no mention of activities this sower might have performed to ensure that he had a successful harvest. In the story, the sower doesn't till the soil, doesn't fertilize, he doesn't water, he doesn't pull any weeds. Perhaps those are activities that are implied or assumed to have been done by this sower, but Jesus only cared to mention that after having sown the seed, all he does is sleep, wake up, watch, and wait. Pretty passive activities. The point that Jesus is making was that this sower does not and he cannot cause the seed to sprout and ripen. No amount of coercion, positive affirmations, or threat of violence is going to make this seed grow. This is the wonder, the beauty of God's created design. It is the seed itself that he has designed to carry within it the power to produce life. Of course, the seed requires proper environment and good conditions, good soil, good weather, sunlight, irrigation, and whatnot. But overall, it is the seed itself that possesses generative power. All by itself, Jesus says. The Greek word is automate, from where we derive our English word automatic. That is, independently, Apart from the work of the farmer or sower, this seed grows. What is Jesus communicating? Well, just as with the previous farming parable at the beginning of the chapter, the elements in this parable, I think, carry forth a similar interpretation. The sower is the one who goes out and proclaims the word, scattering the seed. And this seed in this parable is likened to the kingdom of God, which is growing on account of the power of God's word being sown. And then the soil in this parable could just be a further amplification of that fourth good and fruitful soil that we saw in the previous parable. So what Jesus is teaching now is meant to reveal how it is that this kingdom of God grows according to the implanted word, or the gospel, in the receptive, responsive heart of a believer. Before, Jesus stressed the responsibility of man to receive the word or the gospel. Now, Jesus is highlighting the work of God through the power of his word implanted in the souls of men. The power of God in his word is the means of kingdom growth. On an individual scale as believers, on a corporate scale as a local church, even on a universal global scale, the growth of God's kingdom is supremely and solely the work of God through the power of his word. I don't know about you, but I find that extremely comforting and, and encouraging as a pastor. Sunday after Sunday, I stand here in the pulpit. I scatter the seed of the word, so to speak, in the soil of the pew. And some Sundays, I leave this pulpit feeling disappointed in myself or discouraged. Did I do enough, I wonder? Did I say the right thing, I worry? Was I clear and convincing in my arguments? But really, my worries are really all washed away as I read this parable of Jesus. It reminds me that the burden of heart-level change, of kingdom growth, spiritual fruit, is not left up to me. I can broadcast the seed, and I've certainly been called by God to do so. I believe that. But I cannot bring the growth, the increase. 
I must leave that part up to the Lord. That's his part, his duty. He's guaranteed us that it is the power of his word and it is his prerogative to bring new life, to bring change and growth. The language of the Bible, it's very interesting when it comes to our part as believers in this kingdom of God. We're never said to be the ones who build it or advance it or grow it, but we are only ever told that we enter it, we enjoy it, we experience it, and we invite others to do so as well. The growth, the building, the advance of this kingdom of God is left entirely to the work of God, for it's only a work that he can do, and he has promised that he will do it and accomplish it. This should encourage all of us in our personal evangelism and in the ministry and outreach of this church in particular. The results are not dependent upon you. They're not dependent upon me. They're not dependent upon our leadership team. They're not dependent upon all of us as a congregation. It's not about how convincing our words are or how captivating our presentation of the gospel is. James would remind us and assure us It's of God's own will that he brought us forth by the word of truth. That is the normal means of kingdom growth. This is the key to our own successful spiritual growth on an individual personal level. It's a key to our successful evangelism and a healthy local church body. It's God who begets or brings forth life by the very power of his word. So I think we're left with an important question the means of this growth of God's kingdom is left up completely, dependent upon God's powerful, implanted word, then what can and what should we do? What part do we have to play in this growth? To answer that, I want to direct your attention to the sower again, what we see him doing in this parable, where I think we can glean at least three important applications. First, Because God's word is the powerful means by which God grows his kingdom, we can and we must release the word. Release the word. The sower cannot expect a harvest if he doesn't first scatter the seed, let it go from his pouch and his hand. Likewise, we must plant the word if we ever hope to see any successful harvest at all. The principle is true, I think, in our own spiritual lives. We saw that a little bit last week. We must first put in the effort, the energy to read, to study, to listen to God's word for ourselves if ever our heads, our hearts, and our hands are going to be positively impacted by the word. The same principle is equally true in our personal evangelism and corporate evangelism. Our calling as Christians is to proclaim the gospel. God's word grows on its own, but it will not grow unless it is sown. And this is a great mystery to us, that God is entirely capable of growing his kingdom without us, and yet he has determined, he's ordained that we, imperfect and sinful people, though we are, we're to be a part of this great work. We can't cause the growth, but we go out and we sow, we scatter the seed. And every believer, any believer, is able to do that. Any one of us who have understood the gospel by God's grace enough to receive it and believe it for ourselves is capable to impart it to others. It's encouraging that Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a small seed, not to an oak tree or to mountains. Evangelism is likened to planting a seed, even a small mustard seed, as we'll see. It's not the moving of mountains. It's not the transplanting of a huge, massive, mature oak tree. Just a small child can hold and plant a seed, so even the smallest in faith can carry the seed of the Word of God, the gospel, bring it to the field, and scatter it. It's not rocket science. We should also be careful and diligent to sow the Word of God and only the Word of God. The Bible tells us that kind produces kind. You reap what you sow. Plant an apple seed, you can expect later that an apple tree is going to grow. You sow love and kindness in your life. 
you can generally expect to reap love and kindness from others in your life. So we need to be careful to sow the pure gospel and not our opinions and our preferences along with it. If you want to see gospel fruit, then sow gospel seed. Don't plant a hybrid gospel that's watered down and edited to exclude those difficult doctrines. Proclaim the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let us be industrious. Let us be wise in the spreading of the gospel. Release the word. That's the first application. Second, once we've released the seed of the word, we should and we can only rest in the power of God. Release the word and then rest in the power of God. This is what's represented by the sower in this parable. He sleeps, he rises night and day, seed sprouts and it grows. He knows not how. He's done all that he could do. He's scattered the seed. What's left for him to do is to wait and to watch. He had to trust that that seed is going to do what God has designed it to do. And so it is with us who scatter the seed of the gospel. There's almost never going to be immediate results. We think of our own experiences and we find this to be true. Some of us have loved ones that we've been sharing the gospel with for years perhaps. And by all appearances... That seed has not taken root. And in some cases, it never will. It'll never reach maturity. That's just the way it goes in some soils. But in other cases, some of us have experienced an opposite experience. You've shared the gospel regularly with a friend, family member, or coworker. Maybe they immediately respond. Or perhaps, for a time, it appears again that nothing has happened until maybe years later, They confront you and they tell you, or someone else comes and says, did you know that so-and-so, whom you shared the gospel with so many years ago, has now committed their lives to Christ? They're on fire for the Lord. They're in the ministry of the gospel now. Maybe such a person was yourself. For years, the gospel seed that someone had planted in your life, perhaps in Sunday school or Awana, lay dormant in your heart until God, by His Spirit, breathed new life into you. He said, live, and that seed that had been planted finally sprouted, growed, and you have a harvest. It's during the season of incubation, while that seed lays underneath the surface of the soil, and we're waiting for the gospel seed to sprout and to grow, that we need to practice a patient and a praying faith. We have to rest in the sovereign power of God, who alone possesses the power to regenerate and save dead sinners. We can't do that. Only God can. Think again of the sower in this parable. We don't see him fretting or worried, biting his fingernails that the seed is never going to grow. He knows that germination and, and growth of this seed is going to require time. He may not understand all the details of how this seed is going to grow on its own. He might not even see this growth because it's taken place underneath the soil, but he remains confident that what he's planted is one day going to push through the surface of the soil to bring a harvest. And so he's able to find sleep and rest at night, trusting in the process. Don't overlook that piece of the parable. I think it's absolutely crucial that we not miss the fact that Jesus said this man slept. Sleep is the greatest reminder that we all have our limitations. That we're all insufficient in and of ourselves. We're dependent, created beings. There's only so much we can do, and most of the time, often, we discover that there's so much we cannot do. But we have a God who's said in Scripture to never slumber nor sleep. He's totally self-sufficient, he's independent, he's uncreated, he's infinitely limitless in his power, wisdom, and knowledge. And that's why we can find rest and sleep at night. We believe that he's working when and where we are unable to work. We can rest once we've resigned the work into God's almighty, omnipotent hands. But that's the trick, isn't it? Resigning the work over to God's omnipotent hands. Hand. We so often want to be in control. But over this, only God can be in control. So we need to practice a patient faith. Spiritual growth is 
gradual. It's not instantaneous. The kingdom of God was not instantly and fully manifested in the very first advent of Jesus Christ. It had small beginnings, and even after his death and resurrection, this kingdom was still a young shoot growing out of Jesse's stump. It would continue to grow as these apostles witnessed and they proclaimed the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. In this kingdom, we need to recognize, has not even fully matured on a grand scale yet in our day. There are still places all over the all over the globe where the gospel has yet to penetrate. And then there are still places where the gospel has gone and we haven't seen growth yet. But one day God promises maturity. Our job is to let loose the word and watch it work. Martin Luther once said, after I preach my sermon on a Sunday, I return home and just let the gospel run its course. And if anyone would come to Christ, Luther would later give that person two items. First, a Bible, so that they could read God's word for themselves. And then second, a hymnal, so that they could sing God's word for themselves. And Luther would say concerning this Bible and hymnal, he would gift, let them loose and like fire they will spread on their own. Such is the power of God's word. Once we've scattered the seed of the gospel, we resign the work over to God. We're to wait. And in the meantime, while we wait, the best work we could possibly do is pray. We pray for the seed that we've planted to grow. We pray for the person that we've ministered to and shared the gospel with to come to a saving knowledge of the truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We read in James that the prayer of a righteous person has great power to heal the sick. Well, then surely the prayers of God's righteous ones, made righteous by the life and death of Jesus Christ, his beloved Son, surely our prayers have great power to bring others into the kingdom. That's not to say that we possess the power to save through our prayers, but to say that the one to whom we pray has the only power to save. And that's why we pray. That's why we pray for the lost. We're concerned for them, and we leave it up to God. And what better opportunity do we have to pray for those that we've proclaimed the gospel to than on Wednesday evenings when we gather as a church to pray? Wednesday after Wednesday at 6.30 in the evening, a small group of us gather, we sit down, and we pray over our prayer needs sheet, but we also add those who need salvation. And sometimes that week, that list is rather long, and not all of us could possibly pray for each one adequately enough. But I'm confident that if we had more people, we could bathe the lost in such prayer that we'd see a revival like never before. That's how revivals begin, with prayer and the moving of the Spirit and just a small group exploding out into the community throughout a country. I can tell you of at least one person that we've continually prayed for on a Wednesday evening when I first came two years ago who has since, within the past year, given his life to Christ. We've also prayed for the five-day club just a few weeks ago that children would be saved, and I've heard that multiple children have committed themselves to the Lord. Praise God. All this to say, when there is nothing left for us to do, we put it in God's hands and we practice a patient, patient praying faith, trusting in the sovereign work of the Spirit to move and to work and to do as He sees fit with our requests. So release the word, rest in the power of God. Third, this is the third application from the sower, reap the harvest. When the grain is ripe, at once put in the sickle because the harvest has come. If we're faithful to proclaim the gospel, then eventually we're going to encounter mature fruit ripe for harvest. Then the time of our patience and our prayer will come to an end, and it's time to go out into the field and bring in the crop. This is going to require readiness and diligent work on our part. A wise farmer knows that there's only so much time to use. He can't delay once a field is ready to harvest. If he does, the field and the crop are likely to rot. In other words, we must be prepared before and active in bringing in that ripe fruit. Evangelism will come to an end and discipleship will need to begin one-on-one discipleship. 
or bringing them into the church and allowing the ministry of this church or another church to minister to their needs. Of course, on a grand scale, one day the Lord is going to return for his harvest. He's going to put his sickle to the crop and gather in his people. Right now, the kingdom of God and the reign of Christ, they're an internal reality for those of us who believe. But one day, that kingdom of God is going to finally and visibly be manifested for all to see. And on that day, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord over all, to the glory of God the Father. And to that we say, come, almighty King, come, rule and reign over us right now. So that's the first parable. Second parable showcases, reveals the magnitude of this kingdom's growth. So we've seen the means of this kingdom's growth. It's God's power working through his word. Now we're seeing the magnitude of God's power working out in visible ways. Despite this kingdom's small beginnings, Jesus is going to illustrate that this kingdom is going to grow to encompass and it's going to bless many. Take a look again at this parable of the mustard seed. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The point of this parable is that nobody would expect such an insignificantly small seed, like a mustard seed, to produce such a large plant. I don't know what a mustard seed grows into, a mustard tree. It's typically, uh, a, a mustard seed, if you were to hold one in your hand, it's about the size of a fleck of pepper. And the growth, in Israel at least, is some species of shrub, which grows to be about 8 to 12 feet tall. Now, we understand that Jesus is speaking in hyperbole in his parable. He's not literally saying this mustard seed is the smallest seed in the world, nor is it even the smallest seed in all of Israel. It wasn't even at the time of Jesus. Simply a figure of speech that Jesus is using. After all, this is only a parable we need to realize. And this Bible that we have in front of us, it's filled with such statements that need to be interpreted and taken as figures of speech. Sometimes we can't take everything literally. For example, we've already encountered such a hyperbolic statement in Mark's gospel. In chapter 1, Mark recounts how this great crowd has come to Jesus for healing. And he says, And the whole city of Capernaum was gathered together at the door. We understand that the entire city of Capernaum, which would have been at the time about the population of Taylorville, could not have literally gathered at Peter's door. However, it's a figure of speech used to communicate that a very large crowd had come to Jesus for healing and for exorcisms. And Jesus is using the same literary device in his parable to illustrate how superlatively small this mustard seed was and how surprising the size of its growth is. Its growth is totally disproportionate to the size of this seed. We would have never expected these results It grows so large, Jesus says, that even the birds of the air come to it to find shelter and shade. So in this imagery, Jesus is teaching that despite the meager and small beginnings of God's kingdom, one day it's going to explode in growth and everyone is going to know it. Think about it. At Christ's first advent, Jesus declared in his ministry throughout Galilee, the kingdom of God is at hand. This would have sounded totally bizarre to the Jews in his day. All they saw was this man who had come from very small beginnings in an insignificant backwater town of Israel, Nazareth. Could anything good come out of Nazareth? The Jews were anticipating this kingdom of God to come in pomp and circumstance. It's supposed to be glorious, majestic, powerful, and awesome. It's the kingdom that's going to end all kingdoms. By their estimation, this kingdom is going to overthrow Rome. But Jesus is teaching once again that God's kingdom does not fit the expectations of man. Everything about this kingdom is not what we would expect it to be. 
Its king came not immediately to reign, but to sacrificially die on behalf of his subjects. This kingdom does not come at first with trumpets blaring and angels heralding for all to see and understand this kingdom. Rather, this message of the kingdom was entrusted to a very small group of men who would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, turn the world upside down with the message. It's a kingdom that is spread through a message about the damning effects of sin and the delivering power of a Savior. It's a kingdom that is available to all, but only few will enter. And those who do enter are, in our estimation, the most most odd and unlikely. We never would have expected such people to experience such grace. And those of us who have entered, I think, and say that for ourselves, we know our pasts. We know that we don't deserve what God has given to us in his kingdom. It's clear to us that only God could have done this and that only he receives the glory. Consider the unexpected growth of the kingdom of God here. It's likened to a mustard seed. Once it's sown, it outgrows all these garden plants. Its branches offer a home for the birds of the air. That, I believe, was Jesus' way of saying that this kingdom will include not only the Jews who receive and believe in the Messiah, but also any Gentiles. Birds were often used in the Old Testament to refer to the nations. Such, I think, was the case in the passage that Chris just read for us in Ezekiel 17 a few moments ago. God himself promises to take this sprig, plant it on a high and lofty mountain in Israel, where it's going to thrive, it's going to bear fruit, and it's going to become a haven for every kind of bird. This is what I believe Jesus was alluding to in this parable, comparing the kingdom of God to a mustard seed whose branches grow so large, this kingdom is going to grow so large that even the Gentiles who would receive and believe the gospel would find a place to build a nest. They'd find shelter and shade, a haven. Perhaps this offers us another application to walk away with today. That application is for us to rejoice that we who believe in the gospel, who have become fellow heirs with God's chosen people, members of the same body with Jesus Christ, partakers of that same promise in Christ Jesus and his gospel, can find shelter and shade in the cross of Christ. Like the birds of the air with the mustard seed, we can find shelter in the cross of Jesus Christ from God's wrath against our sin. At the cross, we find a shade that offers us relief from the heat of Satan's blows and the scourge of our own flesh. Through Christ, we may enter, we can enjoy, we can experience a sweet haven of grace and mercy. His is a kingdom that secures us with an everlasting, eternal hope, peace, and love. It's a kingdom that only continues to grow until it's going to encompass and bless many from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Let this encourage us and motivate us to faithfully take the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, and the message of the gospel, scatter it broadly and widely, publicly. Let us trust in the Spirit of God who, by His power, will produce a bountiful harvest Let us rejoice that the Father has graciously opened up a way for us to enjoy the shelter and shade of His kingdom through the life, the death, and resurrection of His beloved Son, our Savior and King, Jesus Christ.